Well, I welcome all of you here today, as well as uh, joining us online, to the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series. It's sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us, we thank the USDOT for their support. It's greatly appreciated for those of us here on campus, as well as those participating via the internet. I'd also like to extend a welcome to those of you joining us via the internet today, which includes representatives from uh, Mont McDonald, uh, Train Dynamics, Hanson Professional Services, Patriot Rail, Metra, uh, Michigan State University, BNSF Railway, uh, Patrick en Engineering, um, Banesh, oh, we have a lot today, um, Gannett Fleming, McClure Engineering, uh, WSP, Illinois Department of Transportation, AECOM, um, RJM, uh, Wilson and Company, LTK Engineering, New York State DOT, Voslo, uh, Jacobs Engineering, Genesee and Wyoming Railroad, National Association of Railroad Passengers, HDR, Canadian Pacific, Union Pacific, and another, uh, uh, Paul Mc, um, from University of Illinois Chicago, and another from BNSF Railway. Um, we really appreciate you all joining us today. Uh, for those of you dialing in, if you'd like to receive PDHs for your participation, please send LB an email with your information as described in the announcement for the seminar. So one of the great success stories of the North American rail industry over the past several decades is the dramatic growth in intermodalism. Accommodating this growth has required substantial expansion of the capacity of facilities where containers are exchanged between the highway and railway modes. BNSF has been a leader in developing this traffic as well as the corresponding development of new facilities and technologies to improve the capacity and efficiency of these intermodal transfers. A significant example of this is their recent expansion of the Logistics Park Chicago or LPC intermodal facility which is the largest inland intermodal facility of its kind in the world. To accomplish this, they installed six new wide-span transfer cranes. The LPC expansion is the fourth BNSF project to use these cranes, but it's unique because of several innovations they introduced and the need to complete the expansion on the existing footprint while minimizing the impact on operations. Our speaker today is Brennan Corrin, who completed both his BS and his MS in civil engineering here at the University of Illinois. We're always glad when alumni return, but we're particularly pleased to welcome Brennan back. Uh, upon his arrival as a freshman a number of years ago, uh, he immediately became involved with Railtech Research and remained very active for the next six years, making numerous contributions to a range of projects throughout his, both his undergraduate and graduate tenure here, culminating in a completion of a fine MS thesis. Uh, and I should say he's another former president of the ARIMA student chapter here. Um, in addition to his studies here in Urbana he, near Urbana, he held two summer internships, the first with the Midwest Planning Office of Amtrak in Chicago, and a second one as a summer intern in the BNSF Maintenance of Way Department in Minneapolis, where he worked for another UIC, UC alumnus, uh, John Check. Following completion of his studies here, uh, BNSF offered him a full-time position as a management trainee in their engineering services group. His first assignment was as a project engineer in Seattle, working on railway expansion uh, projects. And in 2014, he transitioned to a project engineer position in Chicago, where he works on line expansion and intermodal projects. From 2015 to 2017, Brennan served as project engineer for the expansion of LPC, the subject of our presentation today. So he's deeply familiar with the topic and the engineering challenges and solutions employed there. Please join me in welcoming Brennan Corrin, who will talk about the BNSF Railway Logistics Park Chicago Widespan Crane, Widespan Crane Expansion Project. Thank you for the introduction, Chris. Um, can everyone hear me on the microphone? I've got two microphones. Are both of them working? Good? Okay. Well, I'm getting a thumbs up. So uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming out today to see this uh, presentation. Uh, when I was here as a student, I always looked forward to these uh, presentations to see uh, what was happening in the industry and, and learn more, more about railroad engineering. So. It's kind of uh, fun to be on uh, uh, the other side of the uh, fence here and, and kind of come full circle. Uh, thanks 
to uh, Chris and Railtech for the invitation to come down here. Uh, the BNSF uh, team that's down here, we got to see some of the uh, research in progress um, at the uh, test facility this morning. It's a very impressive uh, facility and thanks for that, that tour. Uh, the title of my presentation is Increasing Terminal Capacity uh, Utilizing Wide Span Cranes at Logistics Park Chicago. Uh, through this presentation, I'm going to go over a brief history of the facility and its development over the years and then talk um, about the design and construction challenges that we faced in uh, implementing this project. So this, is, this aerial view shows the Joliet Arsenal. Uh, this was a, a former munitions plant that operated uh, from the time frame of kind of the Second World War up through the Vietnam War. And in 1976, it ceased operations. And uh, in 1993, the land was declared excess by the Army. Um, in 1995, the Illinois Land uh, Conservation Act created the Joliet Arsenal Development Authority, which uh, divided out approximately 3,000 acres for two uh, industrial parks, one of which uh, became uh, Logistics Park Chicago. This aerial uh, view shows uh, LPC in September of 2003. So this facility, BNSF first uh, constructed this facility in 2002. And at that time, we had two uh, intermodal loading tracks, three uh, automotive tracks, and uh, 10 support tracks. Um, the original lift capacity of the facility was about 400,000 lifts per year. This uh, next view shows uh, the facility in April of 2009. And at this uh, point in time, we had undergone a series of uh, incremental expansions to the facility, adding two additional working tracks, uh, or intermodal loading unloading tracks for a total of four, five additional support tracks, and over uh, 100 acres of parking. Uh, also at this, uh, this phase of expansion, uh, automated gate systems were installed in the facility. Uh, these series of projects increased the lift capacity at LPC to about one million lifts per year. This photograph uh, shows the same aerial view, but in April of 2017. So this was after the uh, subject uh, project was completed. The main elements of the project were improvements at Control Point Arsenal, which is highlighted in the circle. Uh, that's where the facility, uh, basically its connection to the main line Transcon, uh, this railroad line here is BNSF's uh, southern transcon between uh, Chicago and Los Angeles. So this, uh, this control point is what allows trains to enter and leave the facility both east and west. We improved that control point by adding, some, uh, adding and reconfiguring some crossovers that allowed parallel moves, which uh, allowed two trains to arrive or depart the facility simultaneously. In addition, we constructed uh, uh, a, uh, two new switching leads, which we call the loop tracks, which uh, hook around the west side of the facility. Uh, what this does is allow for increased efficiency in switching operations uh, for both the intermodal facility and the auto facility, uh, because you can have more, uh, more things occurring simultaneously. Support tracks, we added uh, five new intermodal support tracks and two automotive, uh, primarily automotive support tracks in the yard. Those tracks serve to hold trains uh, before, if there's not a ramp track uh, available, uh, those uh, tracks can be used to hold trains before they're loaded or unloaded. Also, they uh, uh, assist in building longer trains that are longer than the, uh, the length of the loading and unloading tracks. And finally, the wide span crane uh, project, uh, the area of that is, is highlighted in the box uh, below. So all of those elements uh, made up this expansion effort that I'm going to talk about. So 
Some of the design challenges that we faced uh, when we were looking at this project, one was the limited footprint. Um, it was an existing operating facility and uh, trying to shoehorn as much uh, additional uh, functionality into the existing footprint was, was definitely an engineering and design challenge. Relocating ditch B, this was a major drainage ditch that uh, served a large area of the yard and it had to be relocated um, as part of the project. Crane rail foundations, uh, the design and the, and the construction of the crane rail foundations was of critical importance to the project. Electrical challenges, uh, because the new crane, uh, wide span cranes are powered by um, electricity directly, designing and uh, the electrical system to be able to accommodate those cranes was, was another challenge. Stacking cranes and clearances, uh, the configuration of the wide span crane and the stacking cranes that operate next to it, making sure all the clear necessary clearances was, were observed and making sure that configuration was as functional as possible. Uh, finally, construction phasing. Uh, oftentimes, it's, uh, it's easy to draw any configuration on paper, but when, you, when it comes time to build it, you have to make sure what you've designed uh, can be um, constructed, and especially considering the existing facility operations minimizing impacts to operations, we had to make sure that our design was constructible. This slide shows the before and after. If you took a cross section or a slice of the facility, the uh, top view here shows what was there before the project and the bottom shows the configuration after the project was completed. So before the uh, project was started you can see two conventional rubber tire gantry uh, crane tracks with rail guided uh, cranes and then two uh, support tracks and you can see the uh, old location of the ditch. Uh, the new configuration we've removed one of those um, rubber tire gantry tracks and we've added uh, new uh, wide span crane loading and unloading tracks. This is the wide span crane, the large uh, crane with the truss structure. Um, it's a rail guided crane, so it operates on a dedicated crane rail and it's powered by electricity. Um, this crane is the stacking crane. Uh, it's referred to as the 900 series crane. It's a rubber tired crane and it operates in kind of a nested configuration underneath the wide span. So these two uh, crane types are intended to operate together in order to service the needs of the facility. In addition to that, uh, the existing rubber tire gantry track uh, remains in place. So you can see the close proximity of the different crane types, the uh, truck operations, um, and you can start to uh, see why the limited footprint was a challenge in trying to, shoot, trying to fit all of these elements into a limited space. You can see the ditch um, in the lower, uh, the lower view has been relocated to the west from the, the pre-existing condition at the top. This is a uh, photograph showing uh, from the same orientation looking north. The orange uh, uh, pieces here in the foreground, that's one of the cranes or several of the cranes components being laid out for assembly. You can see on the uh, left is the support yard. Um, you can see the ditch, the drainage ditch that's on the west side of the project. Um, you can see the uh, area for the wide span crane tracks, the stacking area where the stacking crane will, would operate. And then on the right hand side, you can see the operation of the existing facility that occurred, continued throughout construction. Crane rail uh, foundations. So one of the, that was one of the key um, focus points as we developed uh, the design uh, with our, uh, our design engineer on this project was uh, Trans Systems. And uh, they helped us uh, work through uh, uh, several different alternatives for the crane rail foundations. Each of the cranes weighs approximately 500 tons. And so distributing that load down into the ground and making sure that it's a safe and uh, robust um, foundation for, for crane operation was important. The tolerances uh, for the crane were very, um, uh, very tight. 
Uh, the crane rail gauge is 140 feet from rail to rail. And uh, we constructed that rail with a tolerance of 3 eighths of an inch uh, in gauge over 140 feet. So that is um, pretty tough. Uh, or you have to be very careful what you're doing to make sure you observe that, that tolerance. Um, when we looked at the uh, geotechnical conditions on site, we took a series of soil borings at regular intervals, and we discovered that a couple things. One, there was a highly compressible soil layer that was um, underneath where the crane foundations were proposed. In addition to that, we found a, a bedrock layer uh, that's relatively shallow. Uh, 20 to 30 feet below the ground surface. Um, so those were other, other factors we considered. Uh, the crane is cantilevered only in one direction. So some of our facilities, uh, Kansas City, uh, the widespan cranes that are, uh, were implemented in Kansas City, the crane cantilevers out or reaches out in both directions. At LPC, it's only in one direction, which affects the loading conditions that the crane imparts onto the crane guideway. Uh, it's, it's kind of an asymmetrical loading because so much more of the crane is sticking out in one direction versus the other. The East Crane Foundation, uh, the proposed construction location of that was on where an existing ramp track was. So we were uh, pretty confident that that was a, you know, the subgrade conditions there were, were good uh, outside of the compressible soil layer. The West Crane Foundation we were concerned about because it had to be constructed on top of what was the old ditch. And so you can imagine the water uh, saturating that soil and just sitting there for, for decades. Um, even if we were to, even if we over excavated and, and carefully built up the fill in, in layers, we had concerns um, uh, particularly that the West Foundation was going to be on top of where the old ditch was. This uh, slide highlights that point specifically. Um, the, this just shows, the, as a reminder, the two before and after conditions. <clears throat> Blowing up the after condition, the yellow uh, trapezoid here shows where the old ditch was. And you can see it right underneath the uh, West Crane Foundation, um, as well as a lot of our utility work that we needed to construct in order to support the project. So we looked at three different, three principal foundation types to support the crane rail. Uh, we looked at a spread footing, which um, would just be a big concrete slab to try to divide that weight out. We looked at rammed aggregate piers, which is uh, when you auger a hole into the ground and then you just uh, place aggregate in lifts and, and kind of smash it in. Uh, we looked at both of those and then we looked at steel H piles. Um, and we did a cost analysis of all three. We also looked at what the expected performance was going to be in terms of um, the settlement that we expected over time. We also, uh, in the cost analysis, we also looked at you know, not only the cost of the, the piling or the, the aggregate piers, but also the concrete, you know, the whole system. And through that, we discovered, or we, we discovered that the H-pile solution was really the best. And what helped us out here was that the, the bedrock uh, was so shallow, that 20 to 30 feet, you know, we didn't need all that much piling to get down uh, to, to a rock layer to get a, a really strong foundation. So we ended up uh, selecting the H-pile uh, solution for the foundation. The ditch relocation, I'll highlight some of the specific uh, considerations there. Um, so this ditch in the yard carried one-third of the drainage from the entire facility. Um, and it, it outlets into detention ponds at both sides. So keeping the ditch uh, draining properly throughout construction was a very important concern to make sure there wasn't any flooding or, or other problems uh, occurring in the yard. Another uh, issue was that really the ditch had to come first. Um, all of the crane rail construction on the west side, the utilities, um, it, was, it had to get relocated before we could get in and do any of that work on the west side. So we started construction, due to the start of the construction time, we were doing a lot of that work in wet and winter conditions, which was, which was a challenge. Uh, utility crossings, uh, so existing utilities that 
both uh, communications and electrical, also compressed air uh, across the ditch at, at um, one location in particular. So relocating the ditch while preserving all those utilities and their functionality and how they support the yard was, was important. Um, as I mentioned, the West Crane Foundation was, was very much the critical path to the project. Also, uh, parallel utilities. Um, like I said, the electrical system that supports the cranes had to be constructed um, after the ditch was relocated on the west side. Electrical challenges. So each, uh, each crane um, consumes a, a lot of power and uh, the cranes have regenerative capabilities so that when they're braking or they're lowering a container down, they actually feed a electricity back into the bus bar, in some cases back into the electrical uh, grid, back into ComEd. And that's not something that the old power system of the yard was able to handle. And so very early on, um, our, our engineers uh, had some discussions with ComEd and started to get the process rolling to uh, upgrade the whole electrical system for the yard. Uh, part of that upgrade, we wanted to have redundancy. Uh, because the cranes are powered with electricity, we didn't want to have a, a outage of some kind impact the operation of the yard. Um, right now, most of the or the other types of cranes out in the yard are diesel uh, hydraulic. And so you can imagine even in a power outage, we can connect generators to lights and we could keep in business uh, with those diesel hydraulic cranes. With the wide span cranes, we wanted to have that same reliability and redundancy. So we, we did get uh, dual power feeds from ComEd uh, to be able to feed. If one feed goes down, we can switch to the other feed. Uh, during the project, the existing electrical switchgear to the facility had a catastrophic failure. And uh, we ended up, the yard was out without power for, uh, for several days until the solution was uh, put together by our, our system electrical team. Uh, but because of that, failure of that existing equipment, we actually expanded the scope of the project beyond just upgrading the electrical system to pretty much totally replacing it at, at the facility. Um, some of the challenges um, for the, the uh, bus bar equipment that powered the cranes, there wasn't a whole lot of space. Again, getting back to the space constraint. So we had to find uh, kind of a home for all this electrical equipment. Um, and in combination of that, we had to, we had to be able to accommodate the uh, telecommunications um, equipment that is also critical to the uh, crane operation. So how we were able to do that, um, even after relocating the ditch, we kind of wanted to use some of that space on top of the ditch to, uh, for equipment. So um, our team came up with this design of using some box culverts at three, three different locations to house electrical equipment. And uh, we ended up calling them electrical islands. Um, we have island one, two, and three. Uh, one is at the center of the facility and there's two others at the north and the south. So this housed um, a lot of the electrical gear that uh, governs the power to the crane bus bar. Also at regular intervals, we had high mass yeah, Chris, you have a question. Could you go back to the previous slide, please? So, um, are you saying that you actually had a bunch of electrical gear in these box culverts? No, um, yeah, they're actually on top. So the box culvert uh, was placed... To, to allow the water to flow. Through. Right, to allow the functionality of the ditch to be preserved, and then all the electrical equipment is uh, placed on top in that, uh, the space that's created by that. Thanks for helping clarify that. Also at regular intervals, uh, yard lighting was a, another important uh, concern we had to look at to make sure that the new area we're going to be operating is adequately lit for our, uh, our folks working out there. And so uh, we had uh, high mass lights that were installed at regular intervals. And uh, again, we sort of borrowed space from the ditch by constructing uh, retaining walls around each light um, so that we could both preserve this maintenance road and then also get a little bit of space for the, uh, the high mass lights and, and their associated equipment. The uh, bus bar, this is the system that powers the uh, wide span cranes. 
Uh, we divided the bus bar uh, electrically into different zones for purposes of maintenance. Um, normally, wide span cranes are, are very reliable. Uh, the one, our experience has been they're, they're very reliable, but they do need regular maintenance. Um, and uh, most of that can be done with the crane under power. However, certain elements of the crane, like the collector shoes, which are the, the parts of the crane that interface with this bus bar, you have to de-energize the bus bar in order to change those elements out. So this is a view uh, on the bottom of the screen, a diagram that shows the length of the bus bar in the different zones that it was divided into. Uh, zone one, four, and seven were maintenance zones. So we could power down these zones and park a crane in there and be able to maintain the electrical equipment on it. Each of those work zones has a buffer zone because if you power down one zone and have a crane parked in there, there is the possibility that another crane operating could inadvertently enter that zone and when it does, it bridges the gap, the insulated joint between those two zones and you could potentially um, energize the zone you're working in. So you always have to have a buffer zone in addition to the zone you're working on. So each of one, uh, four, and seven, there's a work zone and then a buffer zone on, on either side. And that protects the safety of the workers while the cranes are being maintained. There's a, a closer view showing the uh, current collector on the, on the crane. And actually this morning at the, uh, at the laboratory, um, the overhead crane that's in the lab has a, has a similar current collector system. I noted that in the, in the Railtech lab. So that was, that was interesting to see. The, uh, so all the cranes um, have a whole array of cameras. I think it's something like 20 cameras per crane um, for six wide span cranes. And the uh, cranes have to have the ability to transfer those video feeds and also a lot of other data to the terminal operating system and the BNSF network. And so we needed a way to, to transfer all that data but also have a big data capacity. Um, one of the uh, uh, early, in, in the early part of the project, we looked at a, or our telecom team, the BNSF telecom team, looked at a microwave uh, radio uh, in order to talk between the cranes and then the terminal. And after a while, that, that solution was discarded. Uh, it's been used in other facilities successfully, but for this facility, our telecom team elected to use what's called a fluid mesh wireless network. And uh, what what it consists of is a radio antenna on each of the high mass lights and then a radio antenna on each of the cranes. And uh, that allows um, everything to exchange data and talk with it with, you know, b between each other. So that uh, those these photographs here show that radio equipment uh, both on the high mass lights and in the, uh, the DDB cabinets, which are at the base of each light. I'm going to start talking uh, more about the uh, components of the crane rail and uh, some of the consideration that went into uh, selecting those components. The rail is uh, MRS 87 section rail. Uh, it's a UIC rail section. The 87 refers to 87 kilograms per meter, which is uh, about 175 pounds per yard. So this is a much heavier rail than a typical railroad rail. Also, you can note that the shape is, is quite different. Uh, it's got a very thick web, and the, uh, the head has a vertical um, sides. Um, and not all crane rails have that, but this crane rail uh, is, we felt, particularly suited for the use of side rollers. So the cranes uh, operating on the track are kept on the crane rail by the use of side rollers, uh, not unlike you'd see on a roller coaster. Uh, so those rollers come into contact with the side of the, the railhead um, and, and constrain the, the crane on the track. Uh, plates, we uh, looked at um, uh, various uh, types of plates and we, uh, with the design team, settled on this plate type. There's two anchor bolts that secure the plate to the foundation. And uh, 
you know, during the installation, you use these leveling screws as well as the anchor bolts and the nuts on the anchor bolts to adjust the position of that plate before you fix its geometry and grout it in place. Uh, there's a clip, a rail clip that's attached to the plate that has a, uh, a slot in it so that there is some capability of lateral adjustment of the rail position by sliding the clips in the, uh, in the slot that interfaces with the, uh, the plate, or the bolt that, that uh, is uh, attached to the plate. Uh, the plates were spaced on 24-inch centers. So all of our crane rail is um, anchored and also allowed to expand at expansion joints. So unlike uh, railroad track, uh, most railroad track where we have continuous welded rail, uh, we decided to, uh, uh, it's been our practice at crane rail installations to fix the anchor or fix the rail locations and then enable, uh, install expansion joints that allow it to expand and contract with the changes in temperature. And this uh, ensures that the thermal um, stresses that, would, that the rail would otherwise have would not be imparted into the foundation. So the rail is easy, is allowed to float and, and expand and contract wherever it, it wants to. This is a photo showing the crane anchor or the crane rail anchors. You can see it's a pretty, uh, pretty big assembly, and the sole plate underneath it spans the whole uh, length of the uh, of the anchors. Um, I mentioned the expansion joints. Here are some photographs showing the expansion joints. Uh, it's a tapered two tapered rails that, as they expand and contract, they slide past each other. Uh, but the taper allows that to happen without changing the dimensions of the railhead. So as I mentioned, those side rollers are rolling along the side of the rail to keep the crane where it's supposed to be. Uh, that expansion joint uh, lets the rails expand and contract while still allowing those rollers to operate as intended. And each of these were spaced 428 feet apart. And so we had alternated between a rail anchor and an expansion joint, and then another rail anchor, and then another expansion joint, all through the um, 76, 7,700 foot uh, craneway. Uh, magnets. So these, uh, this photograph shows the magnets that are used by the crane to make sure that it um, operates in a straight path down the crane rail. So there's motors on the crane on both the east and the west leg. And the problem is if you have one set of motors going faster than the other side, the crane tends to um, kind of have an angle of attack to the, uh, crane, uh, the crane track, which uh, imparts a lot more forces into the, into the track, which we don't want. So these magnets are spaced at uh, very uh, precise intervals on the track and the cranes are calibrated such that it, it knows the exact speed of both uh, the east and the west sides and it's able to uh, kind of keep itself uh, traveling in a straight path as it goes along the uh, crane, uh, crane rail. One of the problems that we, we encountered is the, the location we selected for the magnets. Uh, some concerns got brought up later about snowplow operations. Uh, in Chicago, you know, winter weather is always a challenge and designing your facility for uh, snow operations, snow clearing operations is very important. Um, and we were concerned that the snowplows were going to come up right to the crane rail and potentially hit some of these magnets. And so we, we came up with some uh, pavement uh, markings and delineators, uh, kind of plastic cones that uh, uh, pop out of the uh, uh, pavement to uh, kind of draw attention to these magnet locations, both from a, a, a walking uh, path of travel uh, hazard as, as well as making sure that these didn't get uh, hit by a, a plow operator in the winter. Uh, are those, the magnets basically sort of a geo-reference point? Yes, yeah. It's the, the crane, they're spaced at, at um, you know, pretty exact intervals, and then the cranes are, are sort of calibrated to know where each magnet uh, exists, and it's able to measure its speed and position based on where, how many magnets it's, it's passed over. So clearances. Um, there's three main clearance uh, questions that we looked at in the design. Um, 
you know, crane clearance questions. The uh, clearance of the rubber tire gantry uh, crane uh, to the, um, the smaller uh, rubber tire gantry crane, uh, making sure that both of those cranes could operate past each other without being uh, inhibited, regardless of position of you know, where each crane is, is picking up or lowering a container. Um, that was something we wanted to be able to preserve that clearance there. In addition, we were, had to make sure there was adequate clearance between the wide span crane and the uh, rubber tire gantry uh, stacking crane. And uh, because both of those cranes are designed to work in the same space and service the same container stack, we had to come up with a system to make sure that when the wide span crane trolley is uh, out on the cantilevered portion of the crane, it is in conflict with the 900 series uh, stacking crane. Uh, so there is a, a software through the communications network, the cranes are able to communicate with each other and know their position along the crane rail and also know their, the position of the trolley, which is the movable part of the widespan crane. So that if, an, if the crane, um, if the 900 series crane is over the stack, the widespan crane will not allow the operator to move that trolley into, into conflict with it. So there's a, because those clearances were so uh, close, we wanted to make sure that that safety feature was, uh, was available. Also uh, truck access. Um, so here you can see the, uh, both of the cranes overlapping and uh, the container stack and the trucks had to share some of the same uh, space. And so we ended up with a four container wide by four high uh, potential container stack with two truck lanes outside of that. The uh, wide span crane has the capability of reaching the container stack and the truck lanes. Um, the 900 series crane can also reach all of those positions as well. But uh, as we uh, designed the project, uh, one thing to note is that the, the 900 series crane, of course being rubber tired, can steer itself around. And so when you're looking at these type of clearances, um, it's important to consider the tolerance of those, uh, of, of that steering mechanism. And it's a, it's a GPS system that's used to automatically steer that crane. Uh, but we had to take a hard look at those tolerances to make sure that under all conditions there wasn't going to be a situation where the 900 series crane would be just a little bit too far west while the widespan crane or elements of the widespan crane uh, was too far east. Uh, so it's important to plan those details out, have those discussions, but also before everything works, go out there and put all the equipment in the same spot and, and measure what, what it, what it, where it ended up. Um, it's good to you know, always verify those, those measurements in the field um, you know, as you're building the project. So now I'll talk um, about the uh, uh, construction of the project and uh, highlight some of the challenges that uh, we, we had. So high level schedule, the project uh, design was started in the first quarter of 2015. Uh, it was uh, let out to bid in October of 2015, and we started construction in November of that year. Uh, we proceeded construction throughout the winter as much as possible um, to the point where uh, the next summer, in June and July, we were able to erect six of the, the uh, six widespan cranes. And uh, in August of 2016, the track laying machine and the BNSF track construction gangs arrived to build the track underneath the project. And uh, all of that, uh, uh, all the while we were upgrading the electrical system and working with uh, ComEd to make those upgrades happen to where uh, we were, the project was in service for a training, um, limited operation in December. And uh, really, we, we didn't start using it until for revenue operation until March of, uh, of 17. So some of the major uh, sequences or tasks, uh, relocating the ditch was the first priority um, and constructing the first 2,000 feet of craneway. Because as the cranes arrived, we needed a place to assemble them and start to test and calibrate them 
In order to do that, we had to have the craneway ready, or at least a piece of it ready, so that we could work the crane uh, commissioning task in parallel with building the rest of the facility. Uh, we ended up removing some of the old track um, at the uh, south end of the facility to create a dedicated crane assembly area. Um, temporary power for the cranes, uh, we had because the, at the same time we were progressing the power upgrades to the facility, uh, we didn't have the capability at the start of the project to power up all six cranes. And so we came up, our, our team um, came up with a uh, temporary power, power solution that allowed us to power two cranes at a time. Um, and so that was, that was also uh, instrumental to you know, bringing more of those tasks in parallel versus you know, having to wait until we got the power upgraded to then start commissioning the cranes. Um, the, uh, all the paving had to be completed prior to the track construction just because of the uh, space constraints of both types of machinery. Uh, project safety. Uh, safety is uh, number one when uh, constructing an expansion project and it is even more important when you're inside an operating facility with other work groups. Um, so it was important that uh, we executed the project safely. Part of that, we had, um, we had to integrate uh, our briefings with the hub operations team to make sure they understood what was going on and we understood what they were doing uh, to mesh both of them together. We came up with this job briefing format. Uh, at some points, we had more than 100 uh, contract employees working on site. And so having a mass briefing with everybody standing in the same location wasn't going to be effective for talking about all the hazards and, and planning the work for each group. So we ended up having a supervisor's briefing um, first, and that was kind of a planning briefing with all the work group supervisors. And once we kind of hammered out uh, plans and, and also a, a look ahead plan for the next several days, that group of supervisors would have a representative meet with the operating team refine the plan as needed, and then after that, each work group would have um, a briefing with their supervisor that attended the supervisor's briefing. And that process could be repeated for any change in conditions or, or new work groups arriving on site. Um, and this helped uh, establish regular communication between all the work groups so that uh, you know, everybody, everybody knew what everybody else was doing and uh, what the hazards of, of other work groups were. Uh, some of the highlight uh, areas that, that were frequent discussion points were the status of the bus bar, whether it was energized or not, um, um, and also construction access and, and, and safety of uh, construction vehicles on the intermodal facility. So the conductor bar, um, we came up, the BNSF safety team helped us uh, develop this uh, pretty uh, robust set of signage uh, for the conductor bar to really highlight the attention that uh, to any, any folks that were not familiar with that hazard. So even if somebody had somehow slipped through the cracks of our briefing process and wandered into the site, um, you know, both during construction and, and now that it's in operation, they're confronted with a whole barrage of, of signs and warnings to uh, make sure that they understand that this is, uh, this is something to look out for. Um, we also, we briefed on, you know, the clearances that were necessary between equipment and that live conductor bar um, and uh, made sure that information was available. Um, part of that included developing a lot of communications for the operating team, uh, both transportation and, and the uh, intermodal team, uh, briefing flyers and handouts uh, so that uh, uh, il illustrated the hazard and allowed, you know, that communication or that information to be easily communicated with different work groups. Maintaining the ditch throughout construction, uh, maintaining that drainage was a challenge. Um, and doing it in, in November, December, and, and January was even more difficult because of the wet conditions. We ended up using a lime uh, to dry the soil out to speed up the construction schedule. So we used about 4,000 tons of lime to dry the soil and get adequate compaction. And we estimate it saved us about a month off of the construction schedule in relocating the ditch. 
So here's a photograph showing the old ditch location. Uh, and here is the next slide is showing uh, the ditch being relocated. So on the left side, this is the newly excavated ditch, and on the right side is the old ditch being uh, filled, filled in and uh, compacted. For uh, a while, we had a temporary um, uh, feed across the ditch, utility conduits, uh, both power and, uh, and telecommunications. All of this fed the auto facility, so it had to remain in operation throughout the ditch relocation. Um, as this progressed, we eventually bored new conduits underneath uh, both the, the old and the new ditch uh, that allowed these uh, temporary lines to be replaced. That's another uh, view showing those temporary conduits across the, uh, across the ditch. The uh, power equipment we upgraded at the uh, front of the facility. Uh, here you can see the uh, ComEd uh, feeds coming in, and then um, uh, the new electrical switch gear that uh, we installed uh, for both the existing yard and the new widespan uh, operation. Um, the uh, tie switch that we installed as part of the electrical equipment, that's what enables us to go between different power feeds uh, from ComEd in case of a failure of one of them. So here we can see the completed ditch relocation. Um, we armored the slope of the ditch with geocell and uh, with aggregate backfill, uh, just to, in an, uh, uh, the idea is to prevent, uh, prevent erosion of the ditch in long term. Here you can also see the uh, access road that goes along the west side of the uh, a bus bar and the crane rail. And that allows access to all of the uh, utility cabinets um, and bus bar along its length. Pile driving, um, since we selected the uh, pile supported foundation, we uh, had to drive a substantial number of piles. They were spaced every eight or 10 feet, depending on which crane rail. Um, and uh, so a total of 1,740 piles. Because we had some pretty good geotechnical information, we were able to select the pile lengths to minimize the number of instances we had to splice piles. So the total number of splices were less than 5% on the, on the whole project. And at peak production, the contractor was uh, driving about 40 piles per day. Um, the first uh, 2,000 feet of craneway uh, was the focus of the efforts at first to try to get that ready to support the crane erection. Uh, so we did the first 2,000 feet on the east side, then flipped over to the west side because by that time the ditch relocation had progressed, drove the two, first 2,000 feet of pile on that west side, and then proceeded uh, back to the east side to drive piles on the east while the rest of the, the ditch was being relocated. So the pile driving operation kind of jumped around a little bit in the effort of um, making sure that the first 2,000 feet of craneway at the south end was ready for when the cranes arrived. And this just shows uh, uh, several piles being spliced. After the piles were uh, driven, uh, the iron workers uh, came in to uh, attach the, uh, or place the rebar cage. Um, so here you can see the uh, steel reinforcement that went into the crane foundation. Uh, it's a four, four foot wide by four foot tall uh, section of concrete with uh, steel reinforcement through it. And that interfaces directly with the piles which were cut off to elevation after those were driven uh, into rock. Um, so here you can see that. Uh, on the right hand side you can see placing concrete um, into the uh, forms uh, to pour the foundation. A batch plant was set up on site uh, what, what this helped us do was minimize the cycle times on the trucks so that uh, we didn't have issues with trucks timing out. Um, so that was, that was helpful uh, to have that on site. And uh, temperature controls we had to look at uh, pretty carefully because at, as soon as the ditch was relocated we were driving piles and then sh shortly thereafter we were pouring the foundation. And in cold temperatures you have to be careful about um, uh, pouring concrete to make sure that it, uh, it doesn't get too cold. So we ended up heating the forms. We would put blankets on the forms and uh, there were propane heaters that we used to make sure that the forms were a, a nice uh, 
uh, warm temperature for when we placed the concrete. And then once the concrete was placed, we ended up having to uh, cover the, that with blankets to make sure it, it uh, properly cured. We uh, did not use slip form construction on the uh, crane foundation. We used uh, conventional form and pour construction. Uh, we did use slip form construction on the uh, access roads in between the tracks, however. Here, this uh, photo on the left shows one of our team members taking the temperature inside the forms. Uh, so every morning we had a pour. Uh, they usually had the heaters on either from the night before or very early that same morning. And uh, before the concrete was poured, we verified that the forms and the temperature inside the forms was adequate. Uh, after all the concrete was poured and it, it was time to uh, drill in the anchor bolts for the crane rail fastening system, uh, we had to make sure that in that drilling process we didn't strike any rebar. Uh, so the contractor ended up using a ground penetrating radar technology which uh, allowed them to locate each of these uh, strands of steel reinforcement in the concrete market on top of the concrete and if, um, if the plate ended up you know, right on top of the anchor bolt for the plate ended, ended up interfering with one of those uh, rebar elements, it could be adjusted slightly to make sure that it, it didn't, the drill didn't strike it. This shows the uh, drilling operation for the anchor bolts. Uh, the alignment of that uh, crane rail, as I mentioned before, being so critical, was first set by the contractor surveyor. And then before we drilled anything, we had the construction manager's uh, surveyor come out and double check it. And then once everybody agreed that it was in the right spot, then we allowed the contractor to proceed and drill those anchor bolt holes. They had uh, several carts set up with hydraulic drills and uh, also used a segment of crane rail with attached plates as a, uh, as a guide template. And uh, it worked fairly well to keep the holes for the anchor bolts nice and plumb and in, in the exact location that they're intended to drill. After that uh, drilling took place, the uh, anchor bolts were then epoxied in, in place. So the hole was cleaned out, uh, get all the vacuum, or get all the dust out, vacuum it, and then, uh, put, and then the contractor put the anchor bolts in and, and epoxied them in position. This shows the uh, crane rail on the east side. You can see all the sole plates are in position, all the anchor bolts are uh, installed, um, and it's just waiting for the, the rail at this point. So once the rail was installed, the, there was another surveying process by which the contractor adjusted the elevation um, and any, any limited amount of um, um, pitch on the plate, make sure the plates were nice and square, make sure the plates were at the right elevation using the nuts on the anchor bolts and using the leveling screws. Once everybody agreed, both the contractor and the construction manager agreed that that was the right elevation, the uh, leveling screws were backed off and the contractor was allowed to grout underneath the uh, the plates. So this is an epoxy grout and uh, they ended up using a trailer with a grout mixing operation in the trailer. They were able to drive along the crane rail and then pump the grout through a hose onto uh, this uh, modular uh, uh, form system uh, which ended up working pretty well. And here you can see they've got the forms uh, built up and these are the employees attaching the hose to the form and then pumping the grout underneath the plate. Um, this kind of shows the uh, nearly completed uh, operation. There would be several finishers working behind to make sure the end product was uh, nice and smooth. So as we completed that uh, crane rail um, in June of uh, 16, it, it became time to start receiving uh, crane components. So this was the area highlighted in green in the left photograph where we used to erect the cranes. And we, we removed uh, the trackage that was already existing there. We removed that trackage, stacked the panels up uh, out of this area, and then filled it with um, base material to make sure that the crane manufacturer had a nice smooth area to be able to uh, erect all of their cranes. Uh, the cranes arrived in two groups of three. Uh, they were fabricated in uh, Europe, in uh, Germany, or I'm sorry, Austria and Poland. 
and then they were uh, shipped across the Atlantic um, and uh, then trucks down from uh, Burns Harbor in Indiana down on, down on site in many, many pieces. And then those pieces were all laid out, welded together. The main uh, top beam of the, the crane was welded together and then in about a week's time, the contractor was able to erect each uh, crane. So each crane took approximately one week to get the main structure of it in place. And that photograph on the right shows, uh, uh, shows one of the cranes being, being uh, constructed. Brian? Yes? These components that came in from Europe by water, did they come all the way to Burns Harbor by water? Yes. Okay. Yes, they did. Um, so the ship was loaded in Port of Hamburg, Germany, and then it, it uh, went through the St. Lawrence Seaway and down through Lake Michigan. I and we. Once Yeah, we, well, it would have been uh, the cranes we've uh, constructed in Memphis and Kansas City, perhaps one of those. Um, and te it mentioned, uh, uh, now that you mentioned that, so. So here's uh, all six completed cranes. Uh, even after the main structure is complete, there were many weeks of uh, wiring and uh, adding walkways and handrails. Uh, so it was just an army of, uh, of contractors from the crane manufacturer uh, working uh, to uh, add all of that uh, extra equipment to the cranes weeks and weeks after the main structure was complete. So as each crane was completed, it was kind of pushed down the segment of craneway to the north to kind of get it out of the way. Uh, make room for the next crane to be erected, but even at the same time that you know the the each operation continued on on all of the cranes to uh, get to the point where we could start testing and commissioning them. So uh, at this time, as I mentioned, the power system of the yard could not accommodate all six cranes, so we could only power up two cranes at a time uh, without causing some problems for our existing electrical system. So we were. Um, faced with the constraint that as soon as a crane was able to start operating, the, uh, the hub uh, management team wanted to use it to start training their operators um, in order to shave as much time off of the project schedule and have their folks ready to go to operate these pieces of machinery. Uh, so we had, to, we had to play nice and, and work together uh, to make sure that they had time to train on cranes that were commissioned while at the same time the uh, crane uh, manufacturer had enough time to keep commissioning each of the cranes in series and, and doing all the tests that were necessary for that process. So that was a, a big coordination point. Um, and then in December of 2016, we were, we were finally able to upgrade the power of the facility and put that in service to which removed that constraint, uh, which allowed, uh, allowed them to go a full bore with uh, training uh, new crane operators. Uh, so this shows uh, some of that uh, uh, training operation here and then on the right was one of the first days of revenue operation of the facility in March of, of 17. And uh, before we take questions, I've got a, a time lapse video to show everyone. So here we can see that uh, we've got the first three group of three cranes that are being erected, and um, as they're completed, we're sliding them down the uh, the uh, crane rail and continuing to work on those with electrical and, and other equipment. And now the second group of three cranes, all the components of those uh, cranes four, five, and six are arriving there, as you can see, and. Uh, now they're starting to assemble elements of uh, five, or now they're, now they're on six. So meanwhile, you can see the construction, as soon as all those cranes were finished, we're trying to stay ahead of them, building all the bus bar and the crane rail, and uh, trying to get that completed to where the time that all six cranes were done, we had a full crane way for them to operate on. So now you can see some of the paving tasks also going on in the background, all of those roadways, the access roadways between the tracks. You can see the slip form paver constructing those uh, roadways out of concrete. 
and they're continuing to uh, wire up and, and commission the cranes here. And pretty shortly, now you see the rail has been unloaded. You see the track laying machine has arrived. And now it's starting to construct track in each of the uh, track slots that's formed by the roadways. So, so pretty soon you'll see it. Now it's built the next track. All the while, the, the rest of the facility is in operation. You can see how many trains are handled. We're, we continued to handle on the conventional tracks while, while this whole project was going on. Now I think uh, you can see a ballast train has arrived. We're starting to ballast and surface uh, some of the tracks on the west side of the wide span crane. Now our track construction forces are plugging the gap at the south end with the panels that were set aside previously. They're getting those all welded together. Now the ba another ballast train has arrived. I'm going to get that one unloaded. Meanwhile, you can now see all the cranes are, are intermittently uh, moving around. They're commissioning, testing, uh, training operators. And uh, now the project is, is pretty much complete by that view. So any questions? Marcus. Yeah, I, uh, one and a half million lifts. Um, so this project increased the facility from about one million to one and a half million. Great presentation. Sure. So the question was, does each crane have one operator? And yes, each uh, crane has one operator uh, who sits in the cab, which is, let me, bring, let me bring this back up here. The cab moves with the trolley of the crane. So as, you know, if they're, if they're over on track, the westernmost track, the operator's cab is moving with that trolley so that the operator is pretty close to where he's handling a, a container. Um, the uh, cranes are set up, uh, the idea with the cranes having so much camera equipment is that there's, there's a possibility in the future of remotely operating the cranes. Um, and so the, we, the, the team was, was thinking about those possibilities when, when those cranes were installed. But for now, there's, there's still a manned uh, you know, operator in each crane. Thank you. And one more question I have with the crane rail. You were talking about you had um, anchor points and then expansion boats. And I was wondering if having those affects how you set the clamping force on those fasteners. So the, uh, there's a torque specification for each fastener. It's got, um, um, as you screw down the nut on the bolt that holds the fastener down, there's a rubber nub underneath that fastener that presses down onto the foot of the rail. And so there's a certain torque that they were supposed to, uh, they're supposed to tighten those two so you get an adequate pressure on that rubber nub that keeps the rail seated. But it's still loose enough to where as the temperature changes, that rail is very easily slides longitudinally uh, to the expansion joints. Uh, and I don't know that figure off top of hand, but I could, I could figure out for you. Marcus? This question doesn't directly pertain to Ford. The cranes, but I was curious, is BNSF using drones to be able to help with logistics and figuring out where all the moves need to take place in inventory once in the yard? That's a great question. Um, I know we're not right now. We did use some drones during the project to help monitor construction and document um, we had our drone team come out to fly the project at certain intervals to, you know, check in on what was happening. But for the regular operation of the facility, there's there's not a whole lot now. But um, I know our uh, our team that works on the, the drones, they're looking at all kinds of applications for them. One of which is um, security, resource protection is using, uh, which I didn't know until we, you know, until we. Uh, we were discussing it yesterday, but our resource protection team is starting to leverage drone uh, or unmanned uh, aerial vehicle technology more. Um, so that's, I would say that's an opportunity for the future.
for the, the crane rail, was the choice of using the anchor and the extension bones uh, a deal accepted or a supplier uh, suggestion on using that uh, system? That was, uh, I'd say both a BNSF and a uh, engineer decision. Uh, so our consulting engineer, Trans Systems, on the project uh, came up with that. Um, all of the BNSF crane rails that are of really long length, uh, you know, several thousand feet plus length, uh, use that anchor and expansion joint combination system. And I think we didn't feel comfortable uh, with some sort of continuous welded rail and, and transmitting all of those uh, thermal forces uh, into the crane foundation. So that, there was a, I think there was a brief discussion on that, but this is the same um, kind of configuration that we've used at other facilities, Memphis and Kansas City, and we were pretty satisfied with it there to where we didn't, we didn't see a, a big need to change it. The one, the, the key is to make sure that when the rail is welded together and when those uh, expansion joints are welded into the crane rail that the gap at the time of, at the temperature of installation is, is correct. Because uh, if you're, if you weld that expansion joint into position and it's, you know, 30 degrees outside, um, you've got to have a much bigger gap versus if it's, you know, the rail temperature is 110 degrees, well, you, you're almost at the end of your your travel for your expansion at that point, so. We have a question from one of our online participants. Yes. Um, do you know how many container trains uh, does this yard handle daily and how many of those are BNSF and how many are UP? I think zero of them are UP. <laughs> um, and uh, in terms of number of trains per day, it really uh, really depends on, you know, there's, there's traffic uh, fluctuations throughout the week and, and even seasonally, but I think it's uh, somewhere on the order of uh, 10 to 15, typically. So the first question is more on like the op operational side of things. So for the, stra for the straddle carriers that operate um, adjacent to the wide span cranes, um, when you when they take a container to stacking, do they take it themselves, or do they load it onto a chassis? A truck takes the takes that chassis to a, a separate area of the yard, and then a separate straddle carrier takes um, then stacks containers, or is it just like just like kind of like in a rotational uh, manner? Yeah. So the question was is 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 getting at, you know, how does the container handled from when it's on the train to basically when the customer takes it out of the yard, correct? Um, so typically, the wide span crane manages the rail cars and moves containers from the rail car to the stacks. And then the 900 series rubber tire gantry crane that's nested underneath it, it predominantly handles movements between the stack and then uh, out, you know, outside drivers that come to pick up their container. And so they will drive into the facility, they'll check in at the gate system, they'll get their ticket, which shows them where their container is. And when they check in, it generates a work order in the crane. And so the crane operator then gets something pop up on his screen that it basically this driver's in the facility or entering the facility and he's gonna want this container. So they can already start planning and, and um, anticipating that. The driver will then come through this area and go to the correct uh, location. The locations are noted on the pavement. We have got a, a numbering scheme out there. So their container might be at R, R60. So the driver would come down here. Um, this is all one-way traffic uh, on this section of the yard. So the driver comes down until he gets to the correct number. And then at, at that point, the, the crane is working on getting his container. And he lowers the container onto the chassis and then he goes to the south end of the yard and leaves. Um, which is different than bar, most of our operation on the east side of the facility. The, the older operation uh, is a wheeled operation, so the containers are placed on chassis and then uh, hostler trucks will move those uh, to uh, lots within the yard and the customer picks up their container from the lot. But with the wide span crane operation, it's, it's a grounded operation so that the customers are getting their containers from the stack. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, that actually is 
Well, one, one thing too to, to note is uh, a lot of times during the day when the driver demand is really high, the wide span cranes will help out in serving some of the drivers. Um, so most of the time they're supposed to be going between the, the rail cars and the stack, but if there's a high driver demand at certain times of day, the wide spans can shift tasks and then also help out you know, servicing the, uh, the customers that come in. Um, I actually have another question. Okay. So how does, how do you determine if a train is routed to the strip tracks where the RTD operate from where the higher gantry cranes operate versus where the wide span crane operates? That's at the discretion of the hub management team. Um, I don't know if they have any hard and fast rules on what they like to do. But I know, you know if, a, if a customer comes in the facility, he won't necessarily know if his container is in the lot or if it's in the stack. So when he or checks into the facility, he gets that information on his ticket. When he, when he comes through the gate system, and then he, he knows, oh, my container's over here in the stack, or oh, no, it's over in lot two, row, you know, row five, space, such and such. When there are sometimes uh, extra scope of work, uh, like uh, the replacement of existing power equipment, as you said, uh, I, I was just curious about how normally how the projects manage in terms of extra scope of work. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question, very perceptive question. So that that's always a um, question that comes up or a challenge when you're building a big project like this. You have to make sure you prevent too much scope creep because when you when we come in and we you know we want to build a new project, a lot of times, you know everybody that's there operating the facility you know has a lot of ideas on what should be done and other things that they should add in. So we want to you know we always listen to a lot of those ideas and try to engage everybody in the planning process. But you do have to keep scope creep under control. But in that case, it was a you know we had the power failure occur and a lot of discussions internally that you know uh, this is an opportunity to upgrade the rest of the yard we're going to have to do it anyway because this the existing equipment out there that was pretty much uh, toast i mean it was done so we had to do it anyway um, it made sense the project was already planning a lot of electrical improvements and so with a lot of communication and making sure that the leadership of of all the teams working on the project agreed that was the right right approach then it was approved and and included as part of the project but that's always a challenge to you know manage the scope and make sure that you know you're not adding too many you know extra things onto your project as it develops all right so thank you Brandon, for a great presentation thanks to BNSF for the presentation last night for the trip down here so it's a uh...